Hey there, welcome back to another video this time around. It is my review of the 2008 horror anthology film, Amusement. Now, uh, before I go any further sharing my thoughts on this film, I would like to give a special shout out to Antonio for requesting this review. And if there's another film, TV show, or topic that you would like to see me discuss in the future, feel free to donate to either my PayPal or to my Patreon. The link to both is in the video description down below, and... I will try to get to your request as soon as I possibly can. Now, Amusement is one of those films that, in all honesty, I was kind of curious about. Because it was a horror anthology, I had honestly never even heard of the movie before. Uh, and, yeah, uh, after seeing it, I could definitely see why this is one of those... Uh, horror films or just anthology films in general that has pretty much fallen completely in between the cracks and been forgotten about uh, by many and relegated to uh, the dustbin of horror history because this is pretty this is pretty bad but not the kind of bad though where I was like this is one of the worst things I've ever seen like it's one of those like lame horror films that there's some intriguing concepts, but it's not utilized as well as it could be. And it's ultimately more forgettable uh, than anything else. It's directed by a guy named John Simpson, who prior to this did a film called Freeze Frame. And then after this, basically did nothing. I think he like did maybe... Another short film, maybe one other indie movie, but like he didn't go on to do much at all after this movie. And I could kind of see why this film, uh, when it was uh, completed, um, it sat on the shelf for a while until it eventually got a release in the US on uh, home video. Initially, it was actually intended to be released theatrically. But uh, if you've seen this film, you definitely understand why this was considered to be not worthy of a theatrical release. The direction by John Simpson, it's just, I don't really necessarily think the direction is all that bad. I, I think it's on par with a lot of other horror films from this era of the 2000s. It really is. Uh, in terms of the shot selection and the camera angles and the overall uh, style and flair and and how he uh, moves the camera. And it's very reminiscent of something you would see from maybe like Platinum Dunes or or uh, some of these other uh, production companies around this time when it comes to horror film. So I think his direction is actually not really that bad like it's one of those things where when i was watching the movie like the direction is one of the few things that i was like oh you know this guy definitely knows his way around a camera there's some interesting uh camera angles and some fun povs here and there he knows how to build tension with with the camera work it's not schizophrenic it's not it's not uh uneven it's fairly uh, consistent uh, when it comes to the visual style and, and what he's trying to do with it. There's even a couple moments when it comes to the camera work that provides some genuinely kind of creepy or eerie moments. Uh, so the direction to me wasn't really th that bad. I, I've seen reviews where they really harp on the directing and I don't really get that. I've seen a lot of lower budgeted horror films that have around like the same budget as this movie did, which is like $10 million or more. And they've looked worse than this. And I've seen worse direction. So like the direction to me, it's, it's like, it's not necessarily some of the best you'll see in the genre, but it's at least serviceable and it's decent enough. And it's definitely one of the better things about the film. If you ask me, uh, the, the script by Jake Wade wall though. Oh man. It's, it's so dumb and so half baked and so 
for the most part, uninspired. It makes you want to bash your head into the nearest wall. And it's definitely fitting because this is the same guy who wrote the Hitcher remake, the Jacob's Ladder remake, and the When a Stranger Calls remake, and Cabin Fever 3. So you know you have like a, a, a serious potential. Uh, of a massive flop when it comes to the writing when you have the same guy who wrote all of those pieces of shit who is responsible for writing this which is too bad because the concept of this is interesting it's an anthology that's not broken up into segments based around a wraparound it's based around these three victims of this psycho and uh they ha have varying different um stories when it comes to their encounter with this uh, psychopath called uh the laugher but they might as well just call him or, or the laugh is what they call him you might as well call him laughing boy it makes me think of that scene in RoboCop. Is like, and you take Laughing Boy with you, <laughs> uh, and and so yeah, you have the laugh, and he has set his sights on these three girls, and they actually have a connection with him because they went to school with this uh, uh this this psycho when he was a kid, and I guess something happened. And they wound up getting the kid in trouble, probably because of his disturbing twisted diorama of a live rat with its chest splayed open uh, like it's something out of Hellraiser. It's understandably something that you would get in into trouble for. And so I guess he's doing he's going after these these girls while they're all grown up for revenge. But even that's not really that clear but there is a connection between the three girls though and it kind of starts out with the yearbook photos and you have all the different uh, superlatives that describe them and they get like x'd out and then you see like this kid who's has who has like the complete opposite in terms of a superlative he has all these psychological profiles that show that he could be extremely dangerous so yeah, it's split up into three different uh, segments that feature uh, the different women. And then there's a finale that uh, is just connecting everything to Briar Hills. So uh, the first segment is called Shelby. And this is this is definitely the weakest one out of all three. And honestly, all all three of them aren't really good. They are pretty bad in varying degrees, but uh, I would Shelby is the worst one, as it deals with these two young adults, Shelby and her boyfriend Rob, who for whatever reason they decide to just start a convoy, and I'm like, a convoy. Like, are they big fans of Chris Christopherson? Are they dire Chris Christopherson fans? And that's the only reason why they're doing a convoy? This makes no sense. Who the hell, in, especially in this particular time and age, deliberately chooses to start a convoy? It, it just, it, it's mind-boggling. And it, it's bizarre. And so these two young adults, they're starting a convoy... And they get joined by a semi-truck and a jeep. While they stop for gas, Shelby sees a girl, another another girl in the truck's back window. And so there's this whole thing that, event, that basically ensues and unfolds. It's like a really lame version of Breakdown in a lot of different ways. I was like, hey, you remember Breakdown with Kurt Russell? Hey, let's do that, but like really shitty. With a very obvious twist. So you find out that the trucker guy who had the girl there, he's not the one to worry about. It's the the Ned Flanders looking guy who 
acts and sounds like he walked off of uh, the set of Kids in the Hall in one of their quirky uh, sketches is completely unbelievable. Like, the guy screams somebody who's wearing a fake mustache and glasses and a toupee and is just acting like somebody is not. Completely looks like uh, somebody that cannot and should not be trusted. And then, ultimately, you find out that, yeah, he's the killer. Wow, he kills the truck driver that you think is the real killer, but actually it's this guy. It's It was Ned Flanders all along, and then he kills uh uh rob and then kidnaps shelby now prior to that the girl in the truck also dies too or or she's taken off camera by the the killer i'm surprised she didn't die of her injuries when she got thrown out of the truck or uh teleported out of the truck I don't I I don't know if it's just an instance of bad editing or the screenplay got lazy and just forgot to explain it but all of a sudden, Rob and Shelby are driving, and then the girl is now out of the truck and is like hitting their windshield and then rolling off of it and onto the asphalt. And I'm like, how did that even happen? Like, how did the truck driver throw her out the window like that? Did she jump out the wind the cab and land on the window? How did any of that even take place? And why does a truck driver live in a, uh, what is essentially an obvious hillbilly, uh, murder house in the middle of the woods? I don't know. I have no idea. So you, you, you think, oh, it's an old isolated house and you know, it, the trucker's the real killer, but no, it's, it's, it's Ned Flanders. It was like seven minutes. It was like, like a seven minute long segment completely utterly useless the next segment is called tabitha and this is the one that features the clown that's on all over the marketing like the marketing makes it seem like this is a clown horror film it's not it's it's a clownish horror film but it doesn't mean that it's actually a clown horror film that is mainly focusing on a killer clown Tabitha is spending the night at her aunt's house to babysit her cousins, Max and Danny. The babysitter left. And of course, you know, the babysitter didn't leave. The babysitter was probably dead. Of course, you find the babysitter later in a shack, which is very predictable. This segment was frustrating because the character Tabitha was so stupid and she is essentially the main character that's really what she is she's the she's the main character in this entire movie because she's the final girl at the end of the of the script and so she goes into the into the room that she's staying in at her aunt's house and it's this room full of like creepy clown paraphernalia and, and clown dolls and all that kind of stuff. And one of them is this giant life-size clown that literally looks like something out of somebody's nightmares. And it looks like a, a, a guy wearing a suit. It doesn't even look like a clown uh, a toy. It l literally looks like somebody in a clown suit just sitting there in a rocking chair. And she walks by it like numerous times like it's no big deal, doesn't grab a knife, doesn't stab it to make sure that it's made out of stuffing or not. It just acts like it's not, it's just her aunt's creepy, weird clown uh, 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 collection. And this is like the, uh, the, the, the crown jewel of it or something. And then the only time she figures it out was when she calls her aunt and then her aunt's like, oh yeah, I don't have that. I don't know what you're talking about. And then this segment just drags on forever because this guy in the clown suit takes forever to actually start to move. And then when he does, there's some okay scenes of tension where he's like breaking through a dresser drawer and a door to get to the girl and the kids and then the kids escape and the girl escapes. So you think, but the clown corners her 
And that's when you transition to the next segment. But like, there's not really a whole lot that happens in this. This particular story spends way too much time literally farting around because there's a whole scene before the clown starts to do anything where the two, uh, um, two cousins, uh, uh, Max and Danny, one of them farts. And then the other one's like, hey, 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 you tooted. And I'm just like, oh my God, really, really? That's exactly what I need out of this film. It was already pretty boring and just lackluster. Now I got a kid farting and we got tooting happening. I'm like, great. Fantastic. I wonder if that kid's uh, favorite toy was that one of those tooting toys <laughs> from Walmart. I bet he probably loves the raft toy where you you press its stomach and it farts. Um, but yeah, I was just like, I, I don't understand at all why you have this random scene with, the, with this kid farting. It's not funny. It's just annoying. And then you get the stuff of the clown and he takes forever to do anything. And when he does something with his giant finger blades and smashes through the door... The kids escape and the girl escapes and he only corners her in a shed later and then nothing happens. There's no body count. There's a the babysitter who got killed after the fact. You just see her dead body and it falls on Tabitha. But that's it. There's nothing to that scene. It's a waste of a eh, legitimately kind of creepy looking clown costume. And then the next one is with Lisa. And if you thought Tabitha was a stupid segment, this one decides to become even stupider. Because this one deals with Lisa and her boyfriend, Dan, who's trying to find uh, Lisa's roommate and friend, Kat, who disappeared during a party. They go to some just obviously creepy old hotel that looks like something out of a cliched horror film or a episode of tales from the crypt that looks like someplace you don't want to be in and don't want to go near at any point or any time of the day, because if you go in there, you will be dead. And for whatever reason, they don't think that way. They just assume that the girl went there. Why would the, why would your friend go to this random creepy hotel or mansion in the middle of the woods in the middle of freaking nowhere why would that be the first place that she would have gone to after she disappeared at a party the night before it doesn't make any sense and so lisa's like hey danny boy go into the hotel go into the murder hotel I like, okay all right i'll go into the horror hotel and then, of course, he dies. Wow. What a shocker. He goes into the horror hotel with, and uses his badge because he's a health inspector to get in. And then he goes in there and he... It, there is not any point when his fight or flight is triggered. Even when he sees this obviously just creepy, weird guy who runs the hotel, who... Is wearing a. He, it looks like he's wearing something that you would see one of the members of the House of a Thousand Corpses wear, and while they're torturing somebody, it looks like some shit straight out of like Doctor Satan's wardrobe, and th and this guy's all like, "Yeah, that's normal. That's totally fine." And then when he he takes the time to let the creepy weirdo guy uh set up an organ that has this slow moving uh uh, uh animatron not really animatronic but some kind of like device and of course when he's staring right at it it pokes him in the eye and kills him yeah that serves you right for being a dumbass and then to make matters even more frustrating and even dumber Lisa, after her boyfriend has been gone for hours, after he went into the horror hotel, she's like, oh my God, I, I, I gotta go in there. Why do you have to go in there? You don't just, your boyfriend is dead. He's dead. 
He's gone. Just, just th- there's no way that he's alive. He went into the horror hotel. Uh, th- there's no way that he got out of there alive. It's been hours. Just accept the fact that he's dead. And if you think that he might be alive, call the cops. Why go in there by yourself? So she goes in there by herself and predictably gets captured by the laugh who takes on a different disguise this time. So he was Ned Flanders in the first segment. Then he's, uh, you know, one of the killer clowns in the second segment. And now he's like a mentally challenged, deranged, uh, victim or prisoner in the horror hotel. But of course it's all an act. So he can trick Lisa and capture her because Lisa does find her friend who is sewn up in a bed. And I guess this guy tortures these victims in beds. It's kind of a creepy image, but it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Like, okay, what, why beds? I don't know. I don't understand. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't make any sense when it comes to this movie. Yeah, so he sees her stuffed alive in in the bed and then tries to free her and then the the supposed uh, mentally challenged deaf guy winds up uh, being the real killer and captures her. And then the rest of the movie takes place in the in um, some kind of I, I think it takes place in the same abandoned house from the first segment, but in a series of corridors and tunnels and mazes that are underneath it. And this is where you find out the Briar Hills connection, the connection between all three of these girls and the laugh, uh, all the way back to when they were in school. And this is where Tabitha is trapped by the laugh. And this is where the most interesting and intriguing aspects of this script start to actually, uh, arise the the idea of taking this demented twisted psychopath's obsession with dioramas and turning it into something that he's using to torture and to uh watch uh his victims complete with uh, peepholes and all these other elaborate traps and rooms that are closing in on each other is honestly pretty inspired i thought that was really interesting And honestly, I think that's what the entire movie should have been. Instead of a horror anthology, in a lot of ways is more of a half-assed horror anthology than anything else, just make it a movie that's about this psycho, the laugh, who has trapped his latest victim in a series of mazes and traps like it's a diorama from hell. And he's just continually looking through the peephole and, and laughing and checking in on his victim and and throughout the film you start to see the different pieces that connect the victim to the killer and and you ultimately see you know previous victims and you see the girl trying to escape or or find different ways to try to get out of the situation or stay one step ahead of the killer and then eventually she finds a way out that would have been a lot better than whatever the hell they were trying to do here. And it still fits with the amusement thing. Like it doesn't have to be a clown. Fine. You just have like a poster that shows like the killer looking through a peephole. Like that's all you could really need. Uh, And it's the amusement is it's all his personal amusement. That's what all of this is. And like, you can see the, the, the premise and you can see some smatterings and elements here that could actually work well and be an interesting and genuinely creepy and kind of unique horror movie, but it it never really goes anywhere. Instead, it continues to be stupid for some reason. There's a whole scene where it's a cop out. You think that the two other girls, uh, uh, um, Lisa and, uh, um, Shelby, they're they're uh tied up and their their chests are splayed open like the rat uh was in the diorama when the the laugh was a kid but it's all a big elaborate practical joke by him 
because they aren't really splayed open. It's just a practical effect. And I'm like, when did he ever learn how to be that good at practical effects? And second, this guy's supposed to be just a crazy psycho who barely has a single coherent thought. And he's supposed to be able to do all of this and set up this elaborate thing. And it's just like, what? It's utterly pointless. It's a, it's a stupid twist, too. And it also undermines one of the creepiest scenes in the film. Because then it's like, oh, well, that's not real. It's like, why even do that? And then the two girls die anyway later. And they die in the most uninspired ways. One girl gets stabbed by the killer. And another girl falls down a, a, a hole. And that's it. Like she's trying to climb up with her friend on a ladder to get out and she falls to her death. And you're like, so all of this, oh, they're, they're not really dying and they're not really tortured and splayed open. Like they're being, uh, um, uh, punished by pinhead and pals. No, they're, they're, they're fine until they die anyway. And then you have another interesting kind of idea and concept where Tabitha thinks she's escaped from the killer, but actually she's gone right into another one of the killer's traps, which is a mobile uh, diorama where he set up what looks like a room, but it's actually inside of a, of a trailer. And so he's got her locked up in there and he's driving away and you're like, okay, where's this going to go? And even the way that it ends is not very good and is just full of more stupidity and just asinine writing. The killer inexplicably left his three bladed finger glove in the trailer for her to use like yeah that was totally a uh, a bright idea uh genius genius move there uh the laugh and so when he puts the opens the peephole again to try to peep on her she grabs the knife the three bladed knife hand and stabs him in the eye and in the face and she escapes and that's the end. That's it. That's 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 the end of amusement. And I was not very amused, to say the least. The horror anthology concept is kind of interesting, but it's not executed well, so it just comes across like as a gimmick. The whole stuff involving the laugh, the laugh isn't really that intimidating or that creepy of a villain. Most of the writing with this character is just silly with him doing all these different disguises. And then when he's supposedly try uh, to be uh, himself, it's a lot of try hard bullshit when it comes to him trying to be creepy. And then you got like the ending, which is he gets killed by stupidity. Like, why the hell would you leave that thing there? Like, that's the last thing that I would think you would want to leave in a place where the the victim could grab and use it against you. And yeah, just a lot of stuff involving the whole script that is just really stupid and just poorly done. Like just make it a whole movie about a diorama from hell. And that would have been fine. It didn't have to overcomplicate things and do dumb twists like, oh, the girls are splayed out, but they're not really. It's just it's just a special effect. And the the cast. Here's the thing about the cast. The three girls, they're not too bad. Uh, Catherine Winnick at times, though, her acting is a bit stiff when it comes to some of her scenes in, in the film in terms of her lines and her line delivery. 
she's not really the best actress period i mean this is she was also one of the uh stars of hellraiser hell world so i mean that goes to show you the kind of film roles that she was getting uh but i've seen worse laura breckenridge is shelby once again fine decent uh similar to what she did in hit and run uh jessica lucas as lisa was also serviceable adequate enough when it comes to her performance she would actually go on to be in the evil dead remake by the way she played the character olivia in that film uh and the worst performer though is absolutely the killer kier o'donnell is the laugh this guy is laughable and not in a good way like, it's the kind of performance that it just stinks up the joint. Like, every time the guy is trying to be creepy, it looks like something you'd see at a horror haunt. And it's acceptable at a horror haunt when it comes to somebody being all over the top and just try hard crazy. <laughs> and the whole, like, <laughs> making faces but when you actually see it in this movie it's laughable it's really bad but not quite as bad as some of the cgi especially the cgi when when uh the laugh gets the three blades right into his eye like it's a really shitty cgi effect i don't know why they couldn't just do that practically because it looks like half that shot is practical. So why is half the shot CGI? Is why why is half the shot practical? But yeah, the cast it, it's not the worst in the world, but it definitely could be better, especially the actor playing the laugh. Like this is your killer, and the guy is just a joke. And the cinematography by Mark Garrett is just it's not particularly great. Uh, at times it's effective, but effectively garish, but at other times it's just kind of there. The editing by Chris Willingham and David Handman is kind of the same. Just, just you know, the typical sort of handiwork that you expect from uh, your average everyday editor who's just doing another job. Didn't really seem like there was a lot of effort put into the film in terms of you know doing some creative editing or transitions or anything of that sort the music by marco beltrami is probably one of his most forgettable and worst scores like it you look at the composer like marco beltrami did the music for this this sounds like creative commons shit like it sounds like public domain music for like a haunted house like, that's really what it sounds like half the time and it, it's an hour and 20 something minutes and that's what the end credits you take out the end credits is only an hour and 19 minutes but it still drags because it's a horror anthology that doesn't have a single segment that's any good it has a, a, some interesting ideas but they're never utilized properly so it's a horror film that's not particularly scary most of the time it's got characters that are just being unbelievably idiotic and dumb. And it's got a screenplay that is dumb. And it's just a, it's just a poor film. It's like, yeah, it's, it's not one of the worst things I've ever seen because the direction is competent and there's some, some intriguing concepts and some things that uh, are potentially uh, uh, inspiring, but, it just winds up being something at the end of the day that is just firmly below average and uh, just bargain bin. That's really what, what, what amusement is. But uh, that's just my thoughts on amusement. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you later. See ya.